Hello everyone, welcome to part 2 of our tutorial 66 about data normalization. In the last tutorial we looked at the need for data normalization and we saw that okay by not normalizing the data you do get some results of course and by normalizing the accuracy gets improved and uh, if uh, you continue the exercise and if you try to use different types of uh, for example machine learning algorithms on the same problem certain uh, algorithms may not even converge. Okay, so this is the real reason why you need to normalize your data so you bring all the values to a specific scale or specific comparable scale. And we did look at a data set. Well, in fact, we did work on a, the same data set here where you can see the data ranged from 10th of a decimal to uh, all the way to about 1000 or so. That's not a huge range, but still it did have uh, some effect on the final result. In real life, you may actually work with uh, data sets that differ even uh, larger. You know, one data set can be in millions or even billions, depending on the application. And the other attribute for that, you know, uh, problem can be, uh, you know, in one hundredths or something. So data normalization is important and uh, there are various data uh, normalization approaches. For example, if you look at this uh, input data, you see there are some outliers out there. Most of the data seem to be around, uh, if you look at here, between 1 to 5. Okay, this is nothing but the zoomed in scale of this, between 1 to 5. But there are certain outliers with values of 400, 600, 500, 200. That's definitely going to affect how your, uh, how your algorithm is going to uh, perform. Now, one way of normalizing this is uh, bringing everything, you know, between uh, uh, 0 to 1 meaning you divide this by the maximum number. In this example, the maximum value is 600. But that, is that really a great way of normalizing? Of course, it brings everything to between 0 and 1, but still you have this outlier effect. And uh, uh, also most of your data is squeezed between 0 and 0 0.005. Pretty much the same problem here. And there is another approach where you can actually uh, uh, normalize this in a different way where the outliers are uh, taken care of in a different way. And this is uh, typically a nonlinear way of uh, normalizing your data. And there is another way up here, as you can see, it's not only compressing it uh, or taking care of these uh, outliers, but also distributing this data into almost like a Gaussian form. Uh, and, and let's look at these uh, three or four examples in Python. So let's uh, jump into our IDE and uh, uh, well, I, I did highlight some of these here. So the examples I showed you is uh, one is min max scalar is something that I use quite often and uh, standard scalar also works OK, but uh, uh, these two are very similar. So I typically use min max scalar and there is something called robust scalar power transformer is the one I showed you in the previous slide where the data is spread, but then the outliers are taken care of and uh, quantile transformer. Uh, it transforms the features to follow a normal distribution. Yeah. Uh, so these these are uh, all of these are available in scikit-learn, but if you look at Keras, for example, it also does, uh, you know, the machine learning uh, a based library, it also has its own normalization and you'll find other normalizations out there. Based on my experience, minmax scalar and power transformer or quantile transformer usually work very well. Okay, uh, you can actually normalize uh, if you have an image, a grayscale image where the values range from 0 to 255, an 8-bit image, just divide the pixel by 255. That's also a way of normalization. In fact, that's that's a way of scaling, not normalization. Normalization typically means you bring the mean uh, to the center and then all the data is distributed in a normal uh, way. Okay, so now let's actually jump into our uh, Python IDE and uh, see how to code a couple of these and see how the responses look like. And now we are in our spider IDE and the example I'm going to use, example data set here, is uh, called California Housing Dataset. You don't need to download this anywhere. It's part of scikit-learn datasets. And the reason why I'm using this is again, because uh, first of all, I do not have a relevant microscopy data set to demonstrate this specific feature. But more importantly, I think we all understand housing market in general. So hopefully this will make the case. So let's go ahead and uh, import all the standard libraries for plotting and reading data, reading images. Again, I shouldn't have imported CV2, but uh, we're not working with images, uh, but let's leave that for now. 
Now, as part of scikit-learn dataset, they have uh, uh, quite a few useful datasets if you want to uh, practice uh, pandas or Python in general. Let's go ahead and fetch the California housing dataset. Okay, so now uh, it's as easy as, okay, I have my housing equals to fetch California housing dataset. So it assigns that to my, uh, to my, it assigns this object, you know, to my housing variable. Now let's convert that into a data frame. And uh, from this housing data set, let's only import uh, data uh, and uh, the target, obviously. So they have the data, they have the target, and what are the columns? The columns are whatever the feature names and target. Okay, so this is typically how you import data sets from scikit-learn, and if you go to their website, uh, for scikit-learn and data sets, they clearly explain how to import this. So this is not uh, something that you need to spend enough time learning. So let's go ahead and import that. Now you should see right away that I have my data frame with about 20,640 entries and nine columns. And let's open the data frame. And let me expand this so we can have a quick look at it. Okay, so here the first column is median income. What is the median income in that neighborhood where the house is located? And the age of the house in years, is it 40 years old, 20 years old? So the whole data set is about various attributes and what is the pr what, uh, price of that house, right? So if the median income is high, typically the house prices are higher in that neighborhood. And how many rooms do you have? How many bedrooms? And what is the population? and average occupancy and uh, where is it located, okay? So all of these are part of this data set. Now you can see the range here. Uh, median income is, uh, you know, uh, between one to eight right here. I don't know, I think this is in uh, hundreds of thousands probably. And the house age is, uh, you know, between 10 to 50 or 60 here. Number of rooms is one through five and uh, so on, and population is in thousands. So this is a good diverse uh, set of numbers. So let's see how we can actually normalize these values. So first of all, if you do uh, your data frame dot describe, I'm transposing so you can actually look at all the values uh, right here. Uh, so median income, we have 20,640 of them. So as you can see, the mean of all of those values is 3.87. The mean of house age is 28, and the mean is right there. And the population, the mean is 1,425, which is uh, uh, obviously a pretty high value. And the longitudes and latitudes, I, I, I don't think we'll be using these as part of our machine learning, but you know, you can see how the range is changing. Okay, so now let's uh, look. Uh, right now we are all set to go ahead and describe, define our x and y values for machine learning. Again, we'll slowly ease into machine learning, but uh, at this point, I think you have to just trust that, okay, my y is the data frame with only the target values. Yeah, the target value is what is the worth uh, or the price of this house. This is what we are trying to predict using machine learning. And my x is all the columns except my target, okay? Including, let's also include the latitude and longitude because they all seem to be very similar location anyway. Okay, so uh, my X is every column except for the target, okay? Because the target column is already uh, part of my uh, prediction. So I'm not wanna, I don't want to include that as part of my X. So X is the attributes, Y is the prediction that we are trying to make. So we need to normalize the values in X, but for before doing that, let's go ahead and do some of the plotting. Again, please have a look at the plotting uh, tutorials that we had. So you can see the distribution right there, okay, for median income. So it's centered around like 3.5-ish or something, and you can see how uh, it's distributed. And uh, average occupancy should be also distributed around, uh, well, it's, it's uh, uh, I don't know why it's, I think this data has like one data set, that's a one data point that says like 1,200 people in one house, I don't know why. This is, uh, maybe we can drop that, but uh, that's an outlier. So this data set apparently has outliers, so we are seeing like one, a large, lot of data right here, but then not much out there. So we'll, we'll, uh, Keep an eye on that. And population, I think, has very similar issues. There is like bulk of the population is distributed right here, but then there is one data point that says 35,000. And we saw that here, right? So uh, which ones? Average occupancy, average occupancy right here. 
you see there is like one data point that says 1243 i don't know how you can fit 1243 people in a house but well that's what it is that's what the data says same thing with your population okay the population on average mean is 1425 but then there is one data point that's or maybe a few data points that are outliers right there okay and finally let's uh, uh, let's actually create our a new column uh, a new uh, data, I mean, variable called X, where we are actually taking our previous X and only including median income and average occupancy, because I want to train this algorithm only on these two and not much. So we can keep, be a bit more focused. Now, I'm not even going to train an algorithm to show you the results. I'll just use these two data sets to show you how uh, normalization results actually look like. Okay, so my uh, column names are going to be uh, whatever the X dot column names. And now let's look at the medium income and average occupancy as a joint plot. There you go. Okay, so on X axis, we have median income. On Y axis, we have average occupancy. It looks like very nicely distributed data set, but that's because I put my X limit and Y limit. Let's actually remove that and then plot it one more time. Now you'll see that I have most of the data centered around, you know, right around zero through five and all of these outliers. Remember this 1,200 people in one house, average occupancy, that's that outlier. Apparently there are other data points that show 600 people in a house or 450 people in a house or 500 and so on. But if you actually uh, plot it with these limits, you can see that bulk of the data, it, it lies between average occupancy of one and five and in X, we have median income between zero to 10. Okay, so this is uh, uh, our full data. So now let's go ahead and look at a few of these uh, uh, normalization techniques. One is called standard scalar, and they're all from scikit-learn preprocessing. The other one, min-max scalar, robust scalar, power transform, and quantile. And the ones below, you can also experiment with this, but let's go ahead and uh, have a look at these uh, ones from the top. Okay, so let's go ahead and import the libraries. And down here, let's start with standard scalar. Uh, and I put some text here, I'm gonna share this file with you. And of course, you can always go to scikit-learn preprocessing and look at all of these, uh, the documentation corresponding to this. They have a depth of information there. So I can only cover only a little bit uh, so I don't make these videos boring for you in case you don't want to get into math please uh, uh, that's that's the whole point of these tutorials to use code pre-written code as a tool to get your application done but if you're curious standard scalar removes the mean and scales the data to unit variance meaning the variance is going to be one and that's how it's going to scale, uh, scale, which means the outliers have influence when you're computing this mean and standard deviation, right? So that's what the scalar is. So let's go ahead and run this and have a quick look at uh, the output. And the output looks no different than the one before normalization, except keep an eye on the range here. Uh, it goes from zero to 1200 and zero to 14. And after scaling is going from zero to 120 and minus two to six or so. So other than the change, change of range, uh, uh, the general structure of the data looks pretty much the same. So I wonder how much of this is going to uh, uh, you know, have an influence in your, in your uh, uh, training. So let's look at min-max scalar. Min-max scalar should be very similar uh, to the standard scalar. Uh, but except all features are squeezed into a range between zero to one. So let's go ahead and run this and you'll see it from the final uh, plot up here. In fact, let's remove the X limit and Y limit right there and plot this one more time. So you can see that the values are going between zero to one for average occupancy and they're also going between zero to one for med uh, median income. So all the values are normalized to values between zero and one. But if you just look at uh, the data itself, it's actually uh, you know, spread in a very similar way. Uh, this does actually help bring all the features into a similar range, except uh, most of your data lies between zero and 0 0.005 and a few outliers out there. So this may not be a right approach if you have outliers, but if you are dealing with images, eight bit images that go from zero to 255, this can be a great way of scaling the pixel values actually. 
Now, robust scaler, uh, the center and scaling statistics of this are based on uh, percentiles. And uh, again, they, they, they're not influenced by a few uh, number of very large marginal outliers. What does that mean? Let's go ahead and run this and look at the output. Again, I'm plotting it between, I'm sorry. Let me go ahead and delete the limits and plot this one more time. You should see exactly the same outliers. So they are also influenced by outliers. Again, if you don't have uh, many out, uh, outliers, then this may be a decent uh, approach. So let's go ahead and plot it within the specific range. And as you can see, every one of these approach, they have their own way of centering it. Yeah, min-max scalar is between zero to one. And this robust uh, scaling, because they are based on percentiles, apparently they are actually centering everything around zero. And uh, the scale goes from, in this case, minus two to like plus three or so. Okay. Uh, to me, I've used this a few couple of times uh, only out of curiosity to test how the result looks like between robust scalar and min-max scalar. I did not see statistically different results between these two. So I don't have much more to add to that. So min-max scalar turned out to be uh, working fine. So I always use that, especially with images. Okay, so now power transformer, uh, as the name applies, it applies a power transformation to each feature to why does it do that? To make the data more Gaussian-like. So it's almost like squeezing it into a normal distribution. And you'll see that from the result. Now let's not uh, rescale the uh, axis and let's just see the raw output. Until now, we've been looking at the output that looks like this, okay? And then I'm rescaling it to only look at values that are within certain range. So now I'm not rescaling it, just looking at the entire thing and you see how this data is, uh, by the way, on the top, you can see how this is Gaussian uh, distributed up here or normal distribution and all the data is in here, including the outliers. So if you have uh, a lot of outliers in your data for some reason, then Power Transformer can be uh, pretty amazing. Uh, I try to use Power Transformer over Quantile Transformer because Quantile uh, is basically Power uh, Transformer except uh, it, it, uh, it, it does additional operation, as I said, uh, mentioned here in the text here, it allows to match a Gaussian distribution instead of a uniform distribution. Okay, what does that mean? You'll see that from the output right here. It tries to fit this in a very nice, you see how you see a square right here. Okay, so it tries to, uh, and I have nothing against it because I haven't tested this extensively. I know this exists and uh, I should admit I've never done a good test of quantile transformer against power transformer. Again, I've tested this only on these type of housing data sets and uh, the breast cancer data set. And there is another data set uh, called liver disease data set that comes from, uh, I think somewhere in South India. And all of these data sets, again, I did not see much of a difference between quantile transformer and power transformer, but I bet there is a reason why we have quantile and power transformer. It completely depends on your data. So when you're engineering your machine learning algorithm, you always hold out part of the data for testing and uh, our validation and keep an eye on the overall accuracy, keep an eye on your ROC, AUC values. If you don't know what that is, you will learn about them pretty soon as part of this tutorial, but see how it's affecting, how your normalization is affecting your uh, end result and then train the model and use that model for your uh, you know, future, uh, uh, you know, testing of your data or feature, future prediction of your data. So I hope you found this tutorial to be useful. And again, in the next tutorial, let's continue the journey of uh, learning about machine learning. And uh, in fact, let's go ahead and talk about what machine learning is in the next tutorial. So thank you very much.